Um, I hope you're all having a fantastic day. So I thought this would be an interesting uh, chance to talk about um, some elements that always I find really interesting in Dwarf Fortress, um, engineering, uh, design, um, the use of minecarts, and, and just some sort of general uh, gameplay experiences. Um, and I had a bit of a wreck of my meagre brain around how would be perhaps the best way to do this. And in the end, I've decided what I think would be fun is to divide this sort of presentation into three broad sections, and we'll have questions at the end of each one. And along the way, I'm going to talk about fortresses that I've um, discovered in, in my search for the community, um, because I thought it would be perhaps best to get away from my own particular style, um, which could be limiting, and to show off perhaps some of the best of what the rest of the community gets up to in, um, in, their, in their dual fortresses. Um, so with that in mind, I thought the first topic we'll cover is design. Uh, I have a really particular way I like to build my fortresses. I, I, get, I actually get a little bit obsessed, I have to confess. It takes me probably about 20 minutes to actually dig the first tile when I first embark. Um, I get very kind of obsessed with exactly how I'm going to build everything, and I don't want to cut any bit of dirt that isn't required. I, I don't know. It's, I'm, I'm a bit special, perhaps. I'm not sure. Um, but in the end, there are other people who have some really different approaches. So I thought we'd cover that. So I'll just launch the screen share and um, see if I can get this little widget to work. And there we go. So here's a fortress I found um, while tootling around on the uh, on the community forums on the Dwarf Fortress uh, file depot. And by the way, I've posted links to each of these fortresses and the authors of them, uh, or the threads that they come from, on my blog, afteractionreporter.com, which I'm sure you as many will fire a link out in due course. But this fortress is the Fortress Steelbeard, and it was kicked off by Aussie Evil. And I think it presents a really traditional way of uh, doing bedroom design, and it's something that I guess I used to do. Um, and I guess is if you're if you're an intermediate player or you're a sort of a new player and, and you've only recently picked up uh, Dwarf Fortress, and it's probably pretty likely you're engaged in a, in a process uh, much like this, where you have um, four by four rooms, perhaps, or two, sorry, two by two rooms, uh, all linked by doors. And making hundreds of doors can be you know, so much fun. And then, of course, a, a vertical stairway off to the right. And uh, in this case. We can see right in sort of in the middle of the screen there the, the vertical stairway, and and you can layer you know, layer after layer of these uh, massive rooms, or in some cases of course just lay them across the entire fortress, so you have a massive sprawl across one level. And in this case, there's a, there's a huge staircase that goes up and down, and in steel beard, um, quite a, a, a sprawling design. And um, I found to my own sort of desires that this can be a little bit um, overwhelming to deal with because the uh, dwarfs take a very long time to move around the fortress. And I've also been warned, and it's a little tip for people, that um, and uh, not to use uh, very long uh, staircase stacks. So that group of X's in the middle is an up-down staircase, and uh, you, if you use a lot of them, you can introduce some quite severe, potentially, some quite uh, significant um, CPU lag due to all the passing calculations that have to go on each staircase. Obviously, there's a choice for the dwarf using to go up or down, and then, of course, there's the, there's the um, uh, eight directions around the square the dwarf can then can then possibly use to, to continue moving, and then you times that by the number of staircases and the number of levels that staircase goes. Now, I believe it can be quite problematic. So the current fashionable thing to do, of course, we all are uh, quite obsessed with dual fortress fashion and, and style and design. Um, I'm sure there'll be a Living Channel program soon, is to use uh, a stack of ramps. You know, dig a channel, go down a level, dig a channel, go down a level, dig a channel, that kind of thing. Or obviously you can use uh, the, the dig ramps option. And in that way you build, um, um, you can go up and down levels easily, but the dwarfs don't have many options when they move up and down ramp. They don't have many passing choices, so it reduces the, reduces the CPU overload. But I thought this was quite an interesting fortress just for the uh, really traditional approach to using bedrooms. And I'll show you some other ways of doing things as well when, when I, I do um, one of my, I guess, my approaches. Another fortress that I think is, is really interesting from um, this perspective is an above-ground fortress. And I have to confess, I, one of my favorite fortresses I ever built, 
um, was above ground. In this case, this fortress here, still be it again, has, has very little above ground presence. There's a, a sort of entrance hallway, there's an above ground farming, it's a bit of a windmill, um, and, and uh, the dwarfs are largely ignoring the surface. But if I flip across to, um, well, let's go back here. If I flip across to the other fortress I've got ready, which is um, Skyscraper 2, which was a, another Dwarf Fortress community game, as a steel beard, um, and I believe it was started by um, Billy Bob Fred, or perhaps it was uploaded to File Depot. Um, but this is an entirely um, above-ground fortress, or largely anyway, but the most interesting parts. And I'm not sure you can quite make it out, but there's a series of rings. I think it's pretty fantastically built. Um, a huge series of rings. Each of them, I think, the plan is eventually to have has a functional uh, um, use of some kind. Um, the centre one kind of houses most of the dwarfs, and then around the edges you've got uh, rings which butt up against the mountain, um, and then out to sort of an entrance on a higher level. So I'll just go up a couple of levels. You can see floor after floor here. Here's another floor, and there's bedrooms. I think, I think that's really quite pretty, really compact as well, little tiny bedrooms. They've got a chest, sorry, a, a cabinet by the looks of it, um, a bed and a door, really, really quite small rooms, which is pretty fun. And if we keep going up, another layer of bedrooms, some storage for dead bodies, many dead dwarfs by the looks of it. And then finally kind of a, a, a corridor across to one of the other cells and a um, and then, and then and then sort of an entrance ramp across to the right, which goes down. And this is also full of dead bodies, so I suspect the fortress is having a little bit of a rough time. Um, never mind, poor them. And then, um, yeah, the, I find above-ground fortresses can be a really fun challenge, so if you find yourself a little unsure what to do, um, you know, give yourself a challenge of making a, an entirely above-ground fortress. Um, I, this is a bit of a below-ground system, which all looks pretty modular and neat. Um, I once played a fortress where we sort of, I guess the, the theme was that we were evil dwarfs or corrupted dwarfs and we had to build like a castle and everything above ground. It was really, it was pretty tough and it was extremely messy. It was a, it was a succession game. So we had a number of players and we each um, took turns to, um, you know, uh, to play a year and pass the, pass the file off to the next person. Um, so, oh my goodness, they've got an undead right in the middle of their fortress. What is that? Ah, a Kia corpse. Hmm, poor them. Never mind. We won't be worrying about these gentlemen too long. So, um, one of the, I think, the features you can really use in Dwarf Fortress to your advantage is, is the vertical nature of your ability to dig up and down. Um, as new players, you, you tend to want to just dig straight into hillsides and create these long, vast halls into the hill because dealing with up and down stairs, dealing with up and down ramps can be really painful. But one of the powers, one of the neat things is if you're dealing with an up and down, if you're dealing with a compact or fortress which has a strong vertical component, you can really take advantage of the short distances that doors have to work so, uh, and walk. So if you have a look at this fortress, I mean, you've got a bedrooms right above sort of a dining room, right above sort of a working floor, and then there's a storage floor below that. So if you think about it, it's also a really short distance to walk, and if you're aiming for a sort of maximum efficiency, um, this can be a really useful way of um, keeping your dwarfs from having to walk half across, halfway across the map. By the time they get there, they want to go have a drink, then they walk back somewhere else, then they want to go on break, then they want to go have a nap, and the next thing, you know, stuff takes a really long time to get done. So I'll just stop the, theme, the, the, the screen share for a second while I pull up, um, I pull up some more fortresses. And uh, so it would be a good time to have any questions right now, I think. Yes, we actually do have one that just came in. Let me get it for you. Patrick asks, what tile set is in use? Uh, that's a good question. I should have mentioned that. Um, the, the main tile set in use here is Phoebus. Um, if you use uh, the Lazy Noob Pack, um, and I really do encourage everyone, if you just Google Lazy Noob Pack, um, there should be a thread on uh, Dwarf Fortress, which will pull up um, the uh, result for you. The Lazy New Pack is a compilation of the game. And, um, <clears throat> and let me just do this a second. It's a compilation of the game. It's got tile sets in it, and it has <coughs> various utilities. And what you do is, I might see if I can pull one up for you. But what you do is you um, start the game with a tile set enabled, which I'll show you how to do. I'll pull up here. So this is a Phoebus uh, pack installed in a game I was running. And if I pull up 
Hey, dear foot cast, lazy new pack. All right. So this is the shortcut that you normally use uh, for those who are using the lazy new pack. And it's pretty straightforward, although this looks confusing. Basically, at the bottom left, you would click Play, play Door Fortress, and Door Fortress would launch. In the middle, there's a bunch of options, including Population Camp. And under the Graphics tab, you can select one of three default sets, the default Door Fortress ASCII set. Iron Hand, which is a really popular tile set, and Phoebus. So most of the games that I'm going to be showing today are actually using Phoebus. One or two are using just the default ASCII. And we'll talk about that later. But Phoebus is really popular because it's quite a clean uh, look. Um, I kind of prefer it, but other people um, may um, prefer different types. There's quite a few out there. The Dwarf Fortress File Depot, which I link from After Action Reporter, uh, dot com has uh, a ton of them. Um, there are some real experts. I'm, I know some of them are in the podcast, uh, in the webcast right now, like Captain Duck, who, who I think prefers an uh, Iron Hand, possibly, maybe a different one. I'm sure, he'll tell you. Um, and uh, from there, basically, all you would choose is your, your, your tile set, and then you'd hit install graphics, and then it would update your current version of Door Fortress with whichever tile set you've chosen. So it can make things a little easier to view. Sometimes it can make things a little bit more confusing. It comes down to personal preferences, and there are, of course, holy wars, this being the internet, over what kind of tile set people prefer. So I thought I'd show you, uh, this is a fortress I've been running for a little while. It's all about to collapse horribly, actually, but this is a, a fortress where I've got a sort of a, a central column of stairs, which is, you know, again, best practice, but uh, it's tidy. And on the surface, I've got sort of a, a, a ring of... Um, uh, walls protecting my sort of encampment in the middle of this. Uh, if I go up a level, I've got a bit of a roof I'm slowly building over it. And if I go down, what I've done is a really tightly vertically oriented um, fortress. And if you're wondering why, what, what all this brown is, I'm in an evil area and it rains um, vile goo. And the vile goo makes everyone nauseous and dizzy. Thankfully, it doesn't turn them into zombies or melt them or anything, but it, it, it does make everything really, really brown and nasty and horrible. So if I go down through the fortress, first layer some farming, this is pretty straightforward stuff, just down through production layers, storage layers, <clears throat> some experimental layers I'll talk about later. And this is kind of my um, favorite thing, which is uh, a sort of a, a grid of housing that is connected only by up and down stairs. So each two by two square cell, each bedroom is connected to two other bedrooms by a little um, by, by an up and down stair, and to the floor below it as well. And so then at the top of this, there's a bunch of downstairs, there's up and down stairs. In the center, there's a sort of central stairway column. There's, a, there's large bedrooms in the middle for nobles, and then I can stack two or three of these on top of each other, and as I expand them, I can get easily 60, 70 dwarf, or 60 or 70 bedrooms a floor. So it's kind of one of my preferred ways of building because it's so compact. And, uh, and and at the bottom, there would be um, potentially uh, uh, more stairways. And right at the bottom, I generally chuck all my um, sort of dining room with a bunch of extremely unhappy dwarfs right now and, and a hospital. And below all of that, I put a well. And it's kind of fun. In the middle of that sort of central column, I can pipe magma or water into if I have access to both of them and move them up and down the stack to different areas if I need it. So. It's just another way of uh, designing a fortress in a slightly different approach. So it's interesting, I think, to come up with some of your own ideas. And uh, I have to confess, I did spend a little bit of time at work one day and a bit of downtime with MS Paint, zoomed into 800%, drawing tiny pixels until I had a design that I sort of, uh, uh, sort of liked. So, you know, just draw in where I thought I would dig until I got this nicely symmetrical design. Um, on the Dwarf Fortress Wiki, which is a fantastic research, uh, research resource, you can dig up uh, a whole page on bedroom design, and you can see fantastic fractal designs and all kinds of amazing efforts to produce the most efficient design uh, mathematically possible, I guess, for giving dwarfs space and letting them also be close to their work environments. So those are sort of some uh, observations on, on design, and, and hopefully there's a few interesting um, things in here for people to, uh, to sort of take away and perhaps experiment with themselves. Just goes to show that, uh, I mean, this bedroom design is at least um, 40 or so bedrooms a floor, and it's really quite tightly, tightly packed. I like my dwarf to be 
sort of in a in a hive. No point in letting them wander the wander the floors. The next topic I kind of like to talk about is minecarts because I don't see a lot of people using um, the minecart features. Uh, minecarts are uh, really interesting. They can be really useful. They can also be a real uh, sort of uh, they can be really hard to take make use of in perhaps a really productive way. Um, I guess sort of there are three main approaches to using them. The first approach is to use them to um, move ore around. Perhaps if you've got a deep, um, a deep dived sort of mining operation and it's spread out across a whole level, you could sort of run a couple of spokes of track to move ore quickly to a central location. Um, might might speed things up. The other approach is to move things perhaps vertically up and down your fortress with ease. And, and this is the approach I'm using a little bit in this. Um, in this and to do sort of quantum stockpiling, as they call it. And the final thing is to use uh, minecarts for defense, and I'll, I'll show you how we can build a minecart shotgun, which is um, really hysterical, kind of impractical, but really, really funny. And then I've got a couple of examples of fortresses which, um, which uh, show them off minecarts to some really good, good use. So the first thing I'll do is I'll just show you at the, in the center of the screen here, I'm not sure you can quite see it, hopefully, as a, as a, as a trade depot. Um, the, the, the entrance to the trade depot, or well, the entrance to this entire fortress is currently closed because there's a, there's, a, there's a couple of ogres and other people wandering outside and I don't really want to deal with them. So the entrance to the trade depot is there and above it is a, is a stockpile, um, which ideally would be where all the goods collected from the trade depot would be dumped. But then of course I have to think, well, I've got to get all this stuff up down my fortress and that's going to involve gorps running back and forth. They're going to be going up and down to my storage layer and back up to the surface again and uh, ah. <laughs> That's not really very cool. So what I've done is I've dug a hole through the middle of my fortress, which, yeah, maybe that has its own security implications, but I haven't really sealed this thing in yet. So I've dropped a hole straight through the center from the top floor. I've channeled a hole, channeled a hole again, channeled a hole again, and then it all lands at this kind of distribution layer. So that's where there's a hole right down to there. And at the top, I've got a very short minecart track which you can sort of see here, there's two stops. And what the point of this is, is this minecart track is connected to uh, have a stop here, the first stop, which is set to guide east, and it's gonna take from stockpile 25. I'll show you how we should do that a little bit in a while. It, it can be really confusing. And then at the end of this, at, at this stop over here, the stop is set to dump to the east. And then at the end of that, guide west when it's empty. So what I can do now is I should be able to assign a vehicle to um, this minecart track and hopefully a dwarf will come along and, and shove a minecart on it. And the point of this is that this, 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 minecart, is, uh, this minecart track is set to pull all sort of mine, all goods from that stockpile, chuck them and chuck all the goods in the cart and every couple of days just drag all of those, uh, push that minecart off to the right and then dump them all down that hole to the bottom of my fortress. This can be really useful if you're sort of deforesting a large area of land and you want to ship all of that wood down the layer. Um, you know, why not just um, shove all of it into, into some minecarts and um, uh, drop it down uh, down a hole to the bottom of the fortress where it can be useful. It can also be useful if you, you're sort of sealing off multiple layers of your fortress. So it's not uncommon for people to want to um, have, say, a, a, an ore production floor as a, uh, on a separate level, so the rest of the normal layer fortress, because maybe that's where the magma is. And you could just drop food down a hole and, and then at the bottom of that hole leave it for those, for those dwarfs to eat, um, and that way they don't have to traipse all over the fortress. Hopefully you restrict them to that area. And of course, if my, my minecart isn't turning up, let me try a different one. So while we do that, I'll have a look at this. Whoa, it's explosion down there. At the bottom of this layer, what I have is a, um, is a, is a, a layer where everything gets dumped. But what I don't have is any storage on that particular location necessarily. What can happen, and it's kind of fun, is that um, when the goods get dropped, if the goods fall onto a layer which has, uh, onto a stockpile which can accept whatever's being dropped, oh, there we go, the minecart's on. If the goods get dropped onto there, then what will happen is that the goods should stay there. 
if there's no stockpile under there that will accept those goods, the goods are likely to be moved. So I'll show you how that works because I've kind of created this infinite loop, which is um, a little bit amusing. Oh, I don't know if you saw that, but one of the doors ran up and pushed the minecart and dropped the goods down the hole. And they'll all be doing that again shortly. And then further down at the bottom here, there's um, some stuff would be dropped. So I want to show you uh, an effect I've got going here where my crafting station, essentially, is going to be dropping goods, um, hopefully, um, down a hole to a storage layer. So this station here, I've got a stockpile. Stockpile is due to take from all of the surrounding workshops, which are various workshops that produce goods. And then, <coughs> and then this craft track has um, the, the, the job of um, filling up from the stockpile and then pushing to the south, and then the goods are going down a hole. And then once those goods are um, dropped to the bottom, they end up at a storage level, and then they will all rain down on the, on, on the sort of gap here next to the stairway. And unfortunately, dwarfs can be killed by this stuff falling on their heads, or at least I've seemed to have accidentally killed dwarfs before. Um, and let me see if you're going to do anything there. Um, I've got some guys cutting gems and stuff, so in theory they should be filled. Um, what also is, so this can be kind of fun to move stuff a long way. Since I've got a kind of an issue now where the shortest distance for some of my dwarfs to drag stuff to stockpiles um, ends up creating kind of an infinite loop where they push stuff down the hole, and then they decide the shortest distance is to move stuff back up to the top rather than move it the vast distance to the edge of, the, um, of this room here. But that makes this sort of kind of fun infinite loop when it eventually works. Um, let me see, have I still got that orders going? Hmm. Okay. So I'll try that again because it's being difficult. There we go. So one other thing that I will talk about a little bit is the use of uh, minecart shotguns and some sort of interesting physics that have come out of using minecarts in some recent research I've seen. So. I've built kind of an experimental floor down here, and, and uh, hopefully you can see it all right. To the far left at the middle there, I've got a stone stockpile that's full of blocks. I've then got two tracks. At the end of the tracks, I've got a fortification on one of them, and I've got some um, chickens and some, pup well, some chicks and some puppies who have volunteered to be part of my scientific experiment. So on the first one, I've got a, 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 a speed test, a speed test here. I'm going to put a minecart on it, and if I look at the stop order, it's set to put, push east immediately, always. And this is just to see how fast the dwarf can, um, just by coasting how fast this cart and how far it will go. So here we go. I'm not sure you can see it. I'll pause the screen. I'll pause and unpause a couple of times, and you can see this cart is just progressing along. And uh, whoops. Oh, wow. Well. Looks like it. Whoa. Stop being difficult, children. Come back. It looks like the um, minecart has run over a couple of chicks and now they're flashing and kind of depressed. So, oh well, that's a bit sad. But as you can see, this didn't go terribly fast. And there is a system in Dwarf Fortress to add rollers, which you can power with a windmill um, by placing the windmill above them or adjacent to them or connected by gears or axles. And, and that can be really neat. And I'll show, you, I'll show you a fortress soon, which has that feature um, used well. But there's another interesting bug perhaps to exploit, which players have discovered. And it's evidenced by these triangles on the top track. And what you can do is you can construct a ramp that is sort of diagonal to the direction you want to travel. And as long as there's a wall blocking the end of the ramp, to the north of this one in this case, the cart won't derail. What kind of happens is I've got some track going east to west, or west to east. I've then got a ramp, which is a series of ramps which are set north and east. What happens is that so I hear, this is a really neat discovery someone on the forums picked up under minecart science thread. <clears throat> if a minecart derails on the ramp, it automatically moves to the top of the ramp, and then it rolls down. In this case, it's rolling down to the east, which picks up speed. And then it does it again for the next ramp, and again and again and again until it picks up a lot of speed. So I want to show you what I've done here uh, to make an interesting shotgun, a minecart shotgun. So I've got this track built at each end, or at this end, sorry, just at this end, I've constructed a track stop, which is build, control C, and then S. It's all under control C, so track, track stop, where you can find the track stop. And this track stop is um, just set to the normal one. I've then got a route. I've called it root. I've called it my speed run test. 
And what I've done is um, I've added a stop. And just don't forget, when you set up stops, unlike every other interface in Door Fortress, which is, of course, traditional Door Fortress, where you place the X counts. So if I was to add a, a stop, um, if I was to choose my, my other, my, my, just my plain non-accelerated test, see, I can add stops here and here, and I create this enormous grid. Um, this almost certainly will do nothing. Um, there's no track. I, I don't quite even know what would happen if the doors tried to push everything around on this. Um, I'm getting alerts on the right-hand side telling me not to do that. It's all saying, no, this won't work. So you need to make sure you move your <coughs> cursor where you want your first stop. So in this case, my first stop, I've set that. I've then got these conditions, and this can be really confusing. I've got push east always, and I can choose the direction. And I also can choose, like, other conditions. Shift-C moves me to look at advanced things. But what I want to do is link to a stockpile. And this drives you crazy the first time you're trying to do it. So I'm going to do that now. S for link to stockpile. I then have to move my cursor over. The stockpile I want to link, I have to press P, <laughs> which makes almost no sense. But it, that's the way it works. That's not enough, though. You might think that's enough, but it's not. Now, I have to actually hit Enter and choose the items I want the dwarfs to take from their stockpile. And then I need to press E on bars and blocks. So what I'm doing is I'm saying, right, dwarfs, I want you to take from that stockpile bars and blocks, and I want you to add them to this other stockpile, to, to the minecart um, when it gets put on the track. But what I also I don't want to do is I, I'm going to switch to the, here, I want to have a, have a setting so that it, it, it does something at about 50%. I don't want it to do it. I don't want it to push immediately. I want that cut to be 50% full before they push it down the track. So I'm going to change the condition, Control-C, and I'm going to go F to Shift F, capital F. So all right, now I've set it, push east immediately, run 50% full, take from the bar block stockpile, and then I'm going to assign a mine cut, V. I'll take this brand new, oh look, it's an exceptional mine cut. Awesome. Pretty soon we should see some Whoa, heaps of dwarfs are going to be running around. Ah, I wouldn't go that way if I were you, Mr. Dwarf. You can have trouble if you get hit. All right, whoa, right. Pausing. There's a minecart on the track. I'm really hoping you can see that. And we should start to see some dwarfs running. Here they go. They're taking all the blocks. They're chucking them on the, into the minecart. If I press H, I can see how full it is. It's 5% full. I oh, know, a bit more than that. It is 10% full. This should happen... Oh, yeah, there's the other minecart going slowly along. I'm just going to keep a close eye. 32% full. 40% full. 50% full. Oh, yeah, there's another full. 45% full. I'm getting ready. So it happens really quick. Dwarf, I wouldn't go that way if I were you. Right. 53% full. They've all stopped. There's a dwarf here about to push this cart, and he's going to just push it. And if you actually if you want a real fun, make a little circular track and set it to ride. Um, it can be really funny just to watch a dwarf run up, jump on the mine cart, ride around, fall off, and then get back on again. It's like a, your own personal roller coaster. Keeps me amused. Wow. Okay. The mine cart just fired. I don't know if you all saw it. The dwarf who fired it has moved three steps, and the mine cart is now almost at the fortification. Um, it picked up a massive acceleration from those ramps. And this is the shotgun chamber, and there's a dwarf, and there's a bunch of chicks, and there's a, there's a, a puppy down there. So I'm just going to pause it, and hopefully you'll see it. Oh, yes. I don't know if that came through. I'm really hoping. All of the blocks shotgunned out of the, the minecart. What happened there, the minecart was accelerated. It hit a fortification. And what happens in that situation is goods are cast up, which there's a ceiling above this, so they don't go any further up, and then horizontally. And in this particular situation, all of these creatures were hit with uh, blocks. So that's a minecart shotgun. High speed acceleration of your cart, fill it with stuff, and then fire at a thing. Let's have a look at a combat log. The dog child is fighting. So the puppy, what happened to the puppy? The rock salt block strikes the puppy in the left rear leg, bruising the muscle. And that continues for several times, and then gave into pain, and then this slams into a chick, and then slams into an obstacle and then got bruised, and then, re and then passed out. Let's have a look at the chick. Oh, yeah, chick was hit by a puppy, hit by blocks, hit by an obstacle, hit by an obstacle and was stunned. Oh, 
bruising muscle, tearing middle nervous, middle spine's nervous tissue. Wow, that's pretty, pretty awesome. So you fire enough stuff at things and you can get some really brutal effects. And if you want to have a lot of fun, you set up a trap component stockpile and fill minecarts with track components. So that was a really little simple test I did to see if this, this accelerator ramp system would work. Um, it is described on the forum and probably on the wiki as well by now, and um, it, it's a pretty uh, neat little invention, I think. But I'm going to switch over to a traditional or a more traditional approach to uh, minecarts and some, some really, really quite awesome experiments that were kicked off in a, in a community fortress started by Girl and Hat on the Dwarf Fortress forums. So while I do that, I'll just stop this share so I can I can flip over Dwarf Fortress uh, seamlessly and we'll have a bit of a ask questions now, please be great. Okay, Peter, we do have um, a question that did come in from Jonathan. I'm not sure if you're able to see it, but I'll just read it for you real quick. Um, Jonathan asks, considering the amount of effort it takes to build upwards above ground, isn't it just way more efficient using the same design but dig straight down? This is Dwarf Fort, don't forget. Yes, it is always more efficient to build down. And <clears throat> really, I guess, the most efficient thing is to build large cubes. Um, you don't even kind of need rooms. You can just space out the beds, put, the, put a bed and put a cabinet next to it and, and space, out the, um, space out the bed and, uh, from the one next to it into a giant kind of emergency you know, dormitory and give each, give each dwarf one of those empty, you know, no wall rooms, and they'll probably be quite happy, um, as long as you keep them happy in perhaps in other ways. They may not be ecstatic, but they should be fine. So, yeah, it is always more efficient to build down. It's just going to be really funny to build up um, because it's a challenge. And um, you can get into some really obscure and obscene um, constructions. Um, you can build um, sort of... Uh, I don't know, complex towers, inverted pyramids, um, all of this kind of stuff. And, and that's really all just for the sake of it. So, um, yes, always better to build down. Um, can be kind of fun to really make a restriction on yourself and, and build up. It's up to, up to the player, I suppose. Um, here's an example of uh, a really interesting fortress uh, called um, Kelnimar. It's probably got a proper, dwarf, proper English name. But I'm not sure what it is. So let's just have a look see if it's in there. Metal Paths. And it was a community game on the Dwarf Fortress forum. So this is one where they, people pass the game between themselves over years. Uh, and then it has been um, well in, imbued with uh, minecart tracks, which I should, you should be able to see entirely encompassing the middle of the screen there. This is a Phoebus tile set with um, colored sprites instead of the sort of nicely little eight-bit drawn characters. And the colors relate to what type of dwarf it is or what their profession is. I'm actually not sure where this um, particular version of the Phoebus tile set comes from. I expect someone in chat will no doubt provide the answer to that. But for some players, I don't kind of prefer it. I like my dwarfs to look dwarfy. For players who want to be really uh, uh, see, have a visual clue, an immediate visual clue to what their dwarfs are, um, up to, whether they're a farmer or a mason or what have you, then the colored sprites like this make it really simple. So if you iron pause it, you'll see them running around. You'll also see an absolute ton of movement. So what we've got here is a central fortress entrance, which is somewhere buried in the middle there. Um, and around it is a racing track of three rows or three lines of um, minor cart track. They've got powered rollers. And you can see around here, the flashing brown is the windmills that are powering them. If I go up a level, you can see above the mining car, uh, mine car tracks, there is, again, more windmills to power this whole contraption. What's awesome about this is the mine carts are being used as a kind of active defense where the, any invading goblin has to cross three, Frogger-style, three roads, which are these high-speed mine carts and they're metal mine carts, so they're heavy, are burning along. There's also a really, really neat uh, trader depot system right at the bottom. Um, well, we got some migrants or something coming in. Right, there's a trader depot system here in the middle of the screen now, which has uh, a bunch of mine carts, which you might be able to see flashing, flashing brown off to the middle right. Um, and then you've got a trader depot. And the idea, as far as I can tell from grabbing this download, is you pull a lever, and I'm going to do that shortly. The mine carts hurtle at high speed through the depot, killing anything in their path basically. So in here, there's, a, there's, there's horse blood, there's elf blood, there's buffalo blood. There's a, there's a lot of horse bits 
and elf bits. And there's a, also there's a, a hatches here. So the hatches open when you pull the lever. Over to the right, these floodgates vanish. All the minecarts are already, or they open. All the minecarts are already preloaded on uh, moving, moving rollers, so they're already ready to go. They whiz through here at high speed, they splat into any elves, and then they drop down a level. Okay. And the level below, they're then, they're then picked up and um, moved to the top up here, where they are, are pushed off this, off this track and fall down back into position, ready to um, eviscerate any elf that comes through. So I'm going I'm to pull a lever here. I'm not sure you'll see it. I'm hoping the webcast will keep up. Um, and then pretty soon, one of the dwarfs will rush over and spend his time. And I'll pause it. Wow, there we go, bam, all the minecarts zoom through the trader depot, they've hit the far wall near the switch, and now they're going to drop down to the level below, which is where they are. So I thought that was a really, really ingenious system for exterminating anyone in the trader depot you wished. I know quite a few players have a big, um, get really excited about the idea of, um, of uh, mincing any elves that come to their fortress, including all the traders. All right, but let's get this racing track started, because it's pretty exciting. Again, at the top here, there's a, there's a, there's a group of mine car, uh, group of floodgates blocking the minecarts from accelerating along the track. Above them, there's the track stop where they start, and these stops are set to um, basically, you know, put the put the minecart on this track stop, give it a push, and then it will, of course, drop down the hole, and then it's loaded, I suppose, in the magazine, ready to go. It's accelerated, and, and all it needs is those floodgates to be pulled down. So I'm going to pull this switch here. And then as I, when, it, when it goes through, minecarts will start racing around the track. It's kind of, it's kind of entrancing, I think, to watch these things go around. And I wonder if one of these, uh, one of the dwarfs may accidentally cross the track. Ah, they survived. And if they do, they, they get quite heavily wounded, usually broken legs, broken arms, broken ribs, that kind of stuff. So the reason there's a lot of red on the screen is there's already been a lot of minecart accidents, and I think they've already hit a few invaders. So... <laughs> I thought this was a really fun um, use of minecarts, and it was quite a, you know, quite a different way of doing things from you know, the usual traditional approach of perhaps building a big wall. Um, just going to talk about some other topics in a second. So I'm going to uh, just stop this uh, stream, and we'll uh, stop this little this share, and we'll switch right back to any more questions. We do have a couple questions that came in. Um, we'll take one from Mark. Mark would like to know, are there any plans for a mobile version of Dwarf Fortress? Do you think many people would be attempting to play via a tablet? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I don't believe Tony uh, Tan, uh, Tan as he's known, would has any particular plans to um, do anything other than, than program Dwarf Fortress as it sits right now. He is uh, his own particular developer, which is why Dwarf Fortress is the kind of interesting and curious game that it is. And the problem that's perhaps not obvious to Dwarf Fortress is it does actually consume uh, uh, quite a few CPU cycles. There's quite a lot going on beneath the hood. And if you've managed to get a fortress to a couple hundred dwarfs and thousands of chickens or cats, without exterminating them all, then, then you will experience the fun of everything slowing down. I just don't think that the present tablets can keep up. And, and I think um, Tarn has managed to maintain um, parity with Moore's Law, so every couple of years the complexity probably does double. Um, so it's not like we're going to see a great, you know, in five years' time, everything will be fast enough that you'll be able to run Dwarf Fortress on a tablet. Yeah, I don't think it's a priority for him right now. It would be kind of fun, though. It would be kind of into murdered cats while on the bus. Um, I'm going to start sharing again. This is a really fantastic fortress that was shared with me by um, Vijek, who's a, um, a forum goer, and he's built an automated magma defense system. So I'm just going to zip back up through the layers. So his fortress basically is very straightforward. On the surface, there's uh, some stairs going down in the far bottom left corner, and as they go down, eventually, there's a hallway, and there's a whole bunch of invaders, and that's quite a substantial force. What are they? All kinds of stuff in here. Goblin pike masters, and there's some master 
people in here as well. And then it drops down again and again and again and again and again and again and again 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 again. And at the bottom of the stack of stairs where the where the entrance of the fortress is, there's these really attractive adamantine bridges. There's five bridges with a pressure plate in the middle, and at each end, it's kind of it's a little hard to see, there's a very thin bridge which raises uh, vertically. So it doesn't actually visually change, but it does raise vertically and block people in. In the middle, there's pressure plates. And these pressure plates are linked to some switches, which if I go up a few stacks, are connected to um, these rooms up here, right at the top of the fortress. He's piped in water, and then he's got floodgates, pressure switches, and um, and then more floodgates to exit the water off the map. And he's also got some water wheels here next to these, which you can see the water there at the top. He's got water wheels and pumps, and this is what's called a dwarven reactor. And it's kind of an infinite source of energy. The energy it takes to power a pump is less than that is generated by a water wheel. So you can kind of create a single room, a couple of layers deep, put a water wheel in it, and a pump above it, and you can, if you fill it with water, or put some water in it, the pump will lift the water above the water wheel, drop it on the water wheel, the water wheel goes around, powers the pump, and then, you know, so on and so forth. You get infinite power for free. And he's piping this power all over his fortress to um, power enormous pumps, uh, which fill the, here's a magma chamber, a chamber of magma here, which fill his, these enormous chambers, his two vertical columns, fills them with magma, a lot of magma. And he's using that as this automated defense. So if you're interested in Dwarven Reactors, the best tutorials really are on the wiki right now. Um, it's a great way of housing power underground without fiddling around with uh, windmills on the surface or water wheels and then trying to get the power about uh, your fortress. It's, it's a pretty neat invention and a really neat discovery by, by some players. And then down here, he's got the system where uh, on the floor above, there are these two vertical columns of magma they are multiple layers deep, and they have a, a, a couple of bridges at the bottom of them, adamantine bridges, actually. And those bridges will vanish when the trap is triggered. Magma drops onto this layer here. When a timer is expired, which is what those sort of complex rooms with the floodgates are all about, everything drops through to this level, where there's some grates. These are, these are grates, so they sift, they sieve out the um, resulting melted goo. And what they leave behind is, uh, so all the goblins won't have you get melted, and what's left behind is weapons. And then below that, all the magma then falls through to this final level, where there's a fortification carved into the very edge of the map. You can see it right at the top edge. This fortification carved into the edge of the map essentially is a drain. Um, everything can just fall off the map. Water can fall off the edge of the map. Magma falls off the edge of the map. So let's go back to, where are we, this level, and watch the goblins come in, because it's, it's it's really exciting if you're a Dwarf Fortress player. Maybe I'm a bit special, but... Come on, goblins. Here they come. They're running into this thing. They think, yep, this is the entrance to the fortress. I'm going to run down the stairway over there. They run across. Oh, something's happened. Middle of, the, middle of this trap's been triggered. Hmm. All the gates have gone up. You probably can't quite see it. And then down comes the magma. Whoosh. Smoke. Bits of goblin melted. And then... It all vanishes because the magma is being drained out to the level below. There's all the magma falling through and then falling through again and then draining into the drain. If I go back up, you can see all the goods are left behind, all the metal, all the delicious, fantastic goblinite, as it's called, which is you know, goblin imported metal up in the trap's reset. And the dwarfs are kind of milling around because there's magma on the on the pressure plate, so they don't quite know what to do. The goblins, sorry. Oh, here we go. Magma's dried up. There should be a path. Come on, dwarfs. Uh, goblins, run across there. Run. So the goblins are thinking, hey, here we go. We've got a path. Yep, magma's dried. And whoosh, again. Melted. And then it will reset in a second. And then some more, more bad guys are queuing up. And if I pop back up to the top, you'll see how the sort of the logic system's working. All right, bridges are down, so the bridges are available again. They haven't got a path yet because the magma is sitting on the pressure plates and they don't want to cross the magma. Now they think they do, they're getting there. All right, you're waiting, aren't you? Come on, goblins, they're waiting. Oh, they've got a path. One of them will find it. Come on, do your calculations. In you go. All right, here we go. Some brave ones are saying, yeah, we've got a path. Come on, guys, let's charge. 
off they go. And what I'll show you this time is up above here, way at the top of the stack, is the logic working. If you can see those X's for the floodgates, you'll see that the, what will happen is triggering the pressure plate opens one of those floodgates, which causes the water to flow onto the pressure plate, which has a little brown ring. And when that then triggers the release of the magma, and it also triggers the next floodgate to open, which causes the water to flow. And because all of this takes time, it, it produces a kind of a timer effect where you can stagger magma dropping, then the magma bridge closes, and then the bridges below sort of close, and then they open to drain out, then they close again, and then it all kind of resets. And then, of course, pumps are also constantly filling. So there you go. Uh, floodgates opening and closing. Water's flowing in and off the map. Pressure plates are triggering on and off. And in the middle, you can kind of see the magma's falling very rapidly. The magma levels are falling rapidly as it drains below. And then the whole thing will reset pretty soon, and it'll all go back to zero, which we should be able to see now. There you go, back to zero. So that's a really fantastic bit of engineering. Um, I don't think I would attempt to build it myself, but I just think it's a brilliant idea having the self-correcting, self-building, um, self-cleaning um, goblinite trap. And I just can't get enough of watching goblins get, get melted in this kind of haze and goo. And they're being trapped in there by those, by those doors at the end, the, so the, the bridges at the end. And then the best thing is, of course, all the, all the goblinite down here, all the weapons, and there's tons of them, bolts and pikes and armor and all this kind of stuff. All the cloths is burnt away, all the goblin bodies burnt away. And because it's such a short exposure to the magma, all the weapons and what have you are surviving. And then you can send it in dwarfs to go collect that stuff and melt it down. So that was, a, I think, a really, uh, a really neat fortress using some um, quite clever engineering. Um, a lot of the best ways to study engineering is to just try it yourself, which I guess is where the whole losing is fun thing is. It, it's often a great idea just to build a single system and just see if you can get it to work. Right? And then, and then. If you need to, if you've got a fortress that's running well, I mean, copy the save file. Go into your full fortress data save. Find the year, find the fortress that you've got, um, World 1 or Region 1. Um, yes, copy that, give it a new name, and then work from that as your kind of experiment and test bed of building stuff. So, you know, building a single track to see if you can accelerate a mine cart. Or building a loop, putting a pressure plate on the track and, uh, and seeing if you can cause a, create a sort of a repeater that constantly triggers the pressure plate to open and close a, a bridge or open and close a gate or something. Um, that can be a really uh, fun way to experiment and, and a bit of a low hassle way. And it's sort of the best way to get to grips with this, this game, I think, is to, is to just keep trying stuff and not being too worried about everything falling over and exploding. If you learn something new every time you play, then you can get not, not without too much hassle into being able to build fantastic contraptions like this. But you might not be able to build the next fantastic contraption, which I will um, which I'll show you while we, we can gather some questions while we do that. We got any questions there, Yasmina? We do. We have two questions, Peter. Uh, we have a question from Hendrik Koning. Um, Hendrik asks, how are, this was a little bit earlier on, how are they preventing dwarfs from getting into the minecart paths? Uh, put them all in a burrow? Question mark. Um, yes, in that particular case. Um, and I've just accidentally closed my presentation manager. I should be back in. Am I back in? Maybe. Um, let's see. It's uh, not come up yet. <laughs> yep, I think I am. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, they what they've done, what they did in that first fortress was they built a burrow and they um, restricted all of the dwarfs to the burrow. Uh, burrows are uh, a really fantastic way of managing your dwarfs. It can be a real fiddle to get right. Um, I always find I mess something up. You know, first of all, you've got to size the burrow. The above ground elements, you size it perhaps just to your fortress box that you want to keep, just the fortress sort of body, the central part, the walled-in part, or the bit you don't want them to cross, like a deadly minecart track. And then below ground, you can, you can define the burrow from the top left corner to the bottom right corner, and that way the dwarfs will happily continue building at all levels and moving at all levels without um, being restricted. And I often do this, and I did that in that, fortress I showed with my minecart experiments to keep my dwarfs inside um, and out of the vile goo that was outside the fortress because by and large I didn't want them experimenting, wandering around in there. 
discovering ambushes and what have you. So burrows can keep them restricted to a, to a relatively you know, to a close area. Um, you assign the dwarf to the burrow once you've got it built, and once it's built, um, they should they should or well, once it's set, they should stay there. Um, I sometimes find they can be quite lackadaisical about uh, sticking to their burrows when first assigned, and that's when you need to go to um, the military menu and to um, you know to to tell to set the burrow to active. So. I'll just set up the screen share and we'll, we'll look at some stuff here. Okay, as you're so. on the track for the um, for the burrows, another question comes in from Erskin. He says, for isolated burrows like that, how do you handle wood needs? Uh, yeah, this is this, this a trick is really to to have a couple of people who aren't added to the burrow. Um, so maybe some peasant who hasn't got any particularly useful skills can be a hauler, and maybe one other person who's, um, I mean. I, I get really possessive about the original seven. So my original cut, my original woodcutter, I would never send him off to the burrows. Uh, sorry, send him off outside once he's got, once I've got a few peasants around to go and send off to do stuff. I'd give him a much more prestigious job of sitting around eating and drinking or something. Um, so yeah, I would find some peasant. I'd tell him to be a woodcutter. I'd take that labour off someone else, and off they would go, and they would um, hopefully be happy in their endeavour, and they would leave. Um, they would, they would, uh, if they get, if they get eaten, I'm not really that worried because it's a peasant. But on the other hand, they're still out there cutting down a lot of a lot of wood. And also, don't forget, of course, once you've uncovered the first layer of caverns, wood will grow in any muddy surface in your fortress. So, um, if you've got uh, a layer of soil, you could excavate a vast sort of, you know, 50 by 50 area somewhere. Um, and, and if you just leave that soil, once the first layer of the caverns is uncovered, even if you wall it off, trees and what have you will slowly grow in there. Take, it takes a couple of seasons for you to get much out of it, maybe a couple of years even. But once you've, clear, once you've got that started, you probably fine for wood. And of course, if you're brave, you can go down and actually seal off some area of the caverns yourself and harvest down there. But that can be much safer than exploring the surface with all its stumble and ambushes and all those kind of problems. Um, so the last fortress I want to show is a really fantastic endeavour by um, by Bloodbeard on the Dwarf Fortress forum, and this is a, a, a dwarven computer. Uh, and dwarven computers, uh, dwarf fortress computers, I think predate basically the Minecraft ones that you've been working on them before Minecraft came out. And I think there's a lot of shared love and the sort of inspiration for them. Um, dwarven computing involves using physical logic gates, I suppose. Uh, if anyone in chat wants to jump in with some links to computer science theory and information theory, they're welcome to. It's going to be on me, to be honest. I'm a politics graduate, so, you know, science, computers, lol, what's that? Um, I'll show you this. This one is fantastic. The guy is trying to build an ELISA-like system into Dwarf Fortress. So you can type in words and then have it respond with ideas or words back to you. What has already been achieved, which is why this guy is going for this crazy ambition, what's already been achieved is a calculator have been done in Dwarf Fortress, um, a tic-tac-toe player, uh, complex timers like the one we saw with the magma um, sort of defense system. What's crazy about this particular fortress is that uh, if I go up a couple of levels, so this is kind of the input area, and you have a look at the machinery of this fortress, which I'll bring into view now, this is the first layer of machinery, and as I unpause it, you can see mile after mile of powered axles. And if I go up again, there's more. This is the water. Uh, this fortress um, machine, this computer uses water as the complete, yeah, the, the thing that does the information science thing. Yeah, let's see, that's really technical. You can tell I'm a computer scientist. So basically, we have all these. Um, logic gates here where uh, water is either on or in or not in a, in a position and then there's pressure plates um, to trigger further events to have your logic gates. So layer after layer of this stuff is completely crazy and it's also really, really, really awesome. So I'll show you what he's managed to do with this when I get back to my, well, here we go. All right. If I press shift in, he's got notes on everything. So I can type in, I can type in a command, which is really cool. So if I find a lever, he's laid them out like a keyboard, and tell the doors to pull the lever, they'll come over and pull a lever. And then a little registry light lights up red, so you need to reset this lever before you pull another one. And then the word H appears. And then I can pull another one. Here we go. Wow, and now it's got fantastically broken already. 
brilliant. I love Joe Fortress. There we go. And there's a space bar down here. And as you can see, so you can input, I'm not sure if it's coming up well, but you can input into Dwarf Fortress or into this calculator, into this sort of computer, letters and off to the right numbers because it's laid out like a traditional PC keyboard. And they appear in the, in the space below. And uh, you, can, you, can, you can spend quite a bit of time just fiddling around typing and stuff. At present, the release version of this, which is this current version, doesn't allow you to um, doesn't allow you anything to come back in the registry, in the green registry below. You know, the, the fortress will not talk to you. But I believe that he's actually got some version of that working on his own. On his own. He has a really fantastic thread on the forum. I'm pretty sure I've linked to it from After Action Reporter. And he um, has talked about what he's done and the logic system behind it. So I, I think this is just a fantastic endeavor. It's completely crazy, as the guy admits. He says this is entirely impractical. But I mean, just for bragging rights, to build a system of over you know, 10,000 gears and all this is absolutely nuts. So there's my failed attempt at writing high or almost worked. And hopefully one day the computer back will reply back with sort of a hello Dave, how are you? Which I think would be fantastic. I'm pretty sure that's his plan overall. And then maybe of course we can program some games to work inside the fortress. That'd be brilliant. Um, Okay, so that's kind of the end of all of my uh, little demonstration of the world of Dwarf Fortress. There's a couple of other things I just wanted to show you briefly. I'm going to pull up the utilities to show that. I'm really, I'm really hoping everyone is already um, broadly familiar with this because it is, it is pretty fantastic. Uh, and default, one of the best utilities, really, the default stuff you get out of your lazy new pack is um, Dwarf Therapist. And it's going to come up now and read all the dwarfs just slightly off the edge of the screen, so let me fix that slightly. I don't know, that'll work fine. So what you can see here, Dwarf Fab Therapist, hopefully is not news to any of you, but it's a tool for managing the labors of your dwarf. Um, what it does is it looks in the memory for Dwarf Fortress, and it then rips out all of the stats for all of the dwarfs. So on the left, I've got all the dwarfs. I can group them by profession, and you can customize all of these professions over to the right. And you can set all of your dwarfs to whoops. You can set all your dwarfs to to do uh, the labors. So rather than go through them individually, you can go right. I want all of. I want you guys here, here, and here. Let me let me select multiple of you. I'm going to give you a custom profession of um, um, all plebs. That's a custom profession I created for all my um, um, useless dwarfs. And then I can um, if. I could get that thing to work. I can set them. No, it's not coming up. Uh, it's off the edge of the screen, sorry. So display, and it's not letting me click on it. But there's a button here. I can commit the changes. And so on mass, I can set all my dwarfs to um, commit pending changes. There we go. I can set all of my dwarfs to different labors. So for example, I can say, all you lie makers, I don't want you working on stone detailing anymore. I want you all working on hunting, yeah, you can all go out the hunters, that'll be suicidal, and wood cutting, and then commit changes. Oh, not silly painting changes. The other great thing is there's, um, there's uh, the ability to look at all the dwarf social skills, so you can kind of see which ones might suit various jobs. You can see military skills, and um, back to the default labors view. There's even a, uh, because this has kind of been open sourced, I suppose, um, there's a, a, a splinter, uh, development run by a guy called Splinters. And it even allows you to do setting of uh, military dwarfs into squads and what have you, I believe. And you can also kind of cheat, which is fantastic, which is to show um, under Splinters um, settings, anyway, you can show uh, dwarfs that are vampires or cursed in some way. And that can be quite nice, because sometimes dealing with vampires is perhaps more trouble than it's worth. But, um, really highly recommend using this. If you need to install Splinters, I'm pretty sure he explains it on the uh, on his on his thread of Dwarf Fortress, and you can Google for Splinter, Splinter with a Z at the end, or and you'll see his um, latest builds. And you basically just would drop the folder into the Lazy New Pack um, Utilities folder, and it would appear in this list, which is fantastic. So uh, do consider using those. Another one I really like to use, and there's not really much let me show it is uh, SoundSense, which is a utility to 
do um, uh, sound uh, in Dwarf Fortress, and it listens it to the activity log. So in your Dwarf Fortress, the activity log that you have, oops, come here, Dwarf Fortress, um, would come up with, you know, if someone's been lost or something's happened or there's been an attack, well, SoundSense listens to all of those and plays the sound every time it picks up one of those. So if someone goes berserk, for example, SoundSense comes along and, and there's, a, there's a fantastic little sound bite of some dwarf screaming and going crazy while everyone else is running around panicked. Um, so that's kind of fun. It, it, when you run it, when you install it, for, or when you run it for the first time, you have to click a button to download all the sounds as they currently are set. But it is a... Um, a quite useful uh, little fun tool. Um, the the only other thing is um, I'm going to see if I can set up SoundSense while we uh, sorry um, StoneSense while we take some perhaps some more questions and I'll uh, show you the last final little thing. Hopefully you're all still around for that. So any any questions? Great, right, thanks. Let me take a look here. Um, we have kind of a, uh, a more question for you. Uh, let's see. Tony asks, how much time do you spend playing and experimenting with this game a day? Ah, oh, that's a really good question. For me, it comes down to, oh, let me see the thing. I fiddle with Dwarf Fortress off and on at least every uh, every week. I mean, I haven't been playing every day because I kind of played quite a lot while I was working on the book, and um, <clears throat> that kind of stuff can drive you crazy. So I um, haven't played a, a lot regularly, but I've recently started playing a game because I, one of the things I really enjoy doing is playing um, succession games. So that's playing on uh, on a forum and sharing a, a turn with other players. So you play for a year, and then you um, hand it off to someone else and see how horribly they, they mangle your beautiful construction. And sometimes you play with a theme. So that can be a really fun thing. So I've been doing that. And there's another style of game I really enjoy, which we sort of coined the term parallel game. So one person creates a world, and then they they go to a tool called Legends Viewer, which is um, in um, which is in Dwarf Fortress uh, utilities for uh, Legend New Pack, Legends Viewer, and then Legends Viewer is kind of this um, uh, viewer of all the exported legends of your world. So the, the, the forum thread has, here's the world, it's got five dwarven civilizations, three of them are led by vampires, a demon in disguise as a human living with humans, and here's the history. And then you each play in that world, and then the first to die shares the save. So anyone joining after that picks up that save. And over time what you get is all the, the, the first to fail thoughts become a new generation. So you end up with, say, four or five forts in, a, in the, the fifth generation. And the, when you go to play, you've got all of their history in the world. And as you play, you get their old migrants and their old characters, and you start carving fort, you carve uh, objects, or you engrave floors with descriptions of what they've been up to. And that can be quite fun to compare, um, to compare notes on stuff like that. Uh, so that's, yeah, I do play it uh, at least every, uh, every few days. Let me fire up Stone Sense, which I'm not sure all of you will have seen. There's a utility for Dwarf Fortress called Dwarf Hack, or DF Hack, and I've linked it to After Action Reporter. And inside DF Hack is a utility called Stone Sense. And Stone Sense is kind of an isometric fortress viewer. So if I just tab back to um, Dwarf Fortress, you'll see here's my fortress I showed you earlier with all the vile goo on the floor and the mine cuts and experiments. And here is it in that's my desktop. That's not what I'm looking for. That's not what I'm looking for. All my junk. Right, here's Stone Sense, which shows a kind of isometric view. You can't control everything in, in this, but if you had two monitors, you could run Dwarf Fortress in this one view. And then in Stone Sense, you can tell it to follow whatever you're looking at in Dwarf Fortress. So if I go and unpause Dwarf Fortress, Stone Sense will keep up, and you can see dwarfs moving around. And as I move up layers, or down, up layers, here we go, you can see the floor above where I've sort of half completed a, a, a covering for my fortress. And if I keep going up, you can see that. And as I go down, you can see dwarfs running around, cats. Oh, you can even see the hole in my fortress. And then below them, the insane amount of chickens. And then further down, you can see my um, fortress shotgun ready to fire, because I didn't save the last time, my, my cut shotgun, and then further down again, the start of my bedrooms. So Stone Sense, it's uh, quite attractive. You can't control anything with it, but it is 
kind of pretty fun, I think, to see this game and looking a little bit like the old 8-bit games. So um, quite a neat little utility. Uh, if you haven't played with it already, then, then check out the link on After Action Reporter or head to Google and Stone Sense or Fortress should pull back some information. It's, it's part of DF Hack. So all you really need to do is install DF Hack, which involves grabbing the files that it provides in the zip and dropping them into a Dual Fortress directory. Um, and then when you run Dual Fortress next time, um, the DF Hack window pulls up. So the DF Hack window looks like this. And there's a whole bunch of fantastic commands you can find, um, which by, there you go, I'm failing to use properly. So there's tons of commands, and they can do all kinds of things, um, reveal things, clean things for you, solve problems sometimes. So you know, DFX is quite a neat little utility, and it has tools like StoneSense built into it, which you run using a command line prompt. So quite a fun thing to do. So anyway, that's um, enough for me. That's a little sideline. Hopefully uh, that little bit was interesting and useful. And uh, if anyone has any um, further questions, I'm, I'm happy to take some. Okay, we have one final question that has just come in from Sean. Sean asks, has there been any consideration for any kind of multiplayer Dwarf Fortress? Yeah, there has, and it's entirely built by players. Um, if you Google DF term, as in DF terminal, but if you Google DF term, someone has created a terminal space system where um, I guess where multiple people can log in, but only one person can control. But you hear multiple people log in to a single game of Dwarf Fortress. I have not played with it, um, but I believe it does work. It's about as close as you're ever going to get to multiplayer Dwarf Fortress outside of running a succession game or a parallel game where you're all playing in the same world. Um, yeah, that's quite a fun, interesting idea. We are going to say a really big thank you to you for presenting such an awesome webcast for us today. It has been so much fun learning about Dwarf Fortress and seeing all the fortresses that you've built, what can be possible with minecarts. My goodness, the audience, uh, all the comments that are coming in, people had a really good time on this. So we really thank you for sharing all your knowledge and expertise with us today. Brilliant. Thanks. And, and just to note, they're not all ports. Those are lots of different players. But uh, yeah, I mean, um, dig up Forts, Dwarf Fortress file depot, and, and check out the crazy stuff people get up to, the other people's approaches. And thank you very much. I hope you've had a good time.